Hello and welcome to the NBA Outlet presented by OTGBasketball.com. Make sure you follow OTG on Twitter at OTG Basketball. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me, as always, on the NBA Outlet, my guy, Corey Waldron. How you doing, Corey? Pretty good, Nick. We're right into the season. There's no more scripted preview series. We're right into a nice little free roam conversation. Yeah, back to our regular NBA Outlet programming. The NBA is back. We had our first two games last night. Before we talk about basketball, we got some big announcements at OTG. A lot of new podcasts for you guys. Obviously, we have the NBA Outlet. Now we have Corey's new podcast, Full Access Hoops, general NBA pod with some real humor. We got the JBT pod with Jack Manuel and Nick Brusink, two Australian dudes with funny takes. Then we got the Brooklyn Buzz pod, all about the Nets, and that's hosted by me. Super pumped to give you guys all these podcasts, and we have more coming. Corey, you want to tell them a little bit about your pod? Yeah, Full Access Hoops. Um, great. To be, I mean, really happy to be a part of the OTG podcast network that we're starting to build up here. Um, it's pretty much just a lounge, you know, when you're sitting at home watching the game with your buddies. That's the kind of atmosphere the podcast is. It's just a couple of guys sitting there talking hoops. You know, we give takes. We talk about stuff going around the league, but we also try and add some humor. You know, in the league, there's some thick players in the league. We just want to <laughs> bring a little humor to the basketball world. It's a really funny show. They launched their first episode about a day ago, and, you know, there's some real good humor, like you said, some real thick players. But let's talk about the hoops last night. First game, obviously, Celtics and Cavaliers. And before we get started, you know, we just want to give our prayers and love to Gordon Hayward. He went down in the first quarter last night with a broken ankle, a broken ankle, dislocated ankle, you know, a fracture down there. Really gruesome play. Feel for him, especially first game of the season. We know he worked so hard since getting in the league and then joining a new team with championship aspirations. It's just a terrible moment. It kind of sucked the sucked the life right of that game. But I mean, even just mentioning it, my heart is in my stomach. It's one of those injuries, you know, I, I, I compare it to like the Paul George injury in Vegas a couple of years ago. You know, it's just one of those things where it just, uh, Jalen Brown's reaction after it happened with his hands on his head and his face, you know, his mouth wide open in awe. You know, that's pretty much what the reaction was. Um, getting that huge contract, you know, getting to play with Brad Stevens for the first time in, uh, since his college days. There's just so much promise going to the Celtics here. And, you know, six minutes, Hayward has to now cover ahead of him. I, I hope he gets through it. Yeah, very tough, and it just sucks. You know, like you said, the reactions of the players. I would say the only positive that came out, it was nice to see all the NBA players show their support for Hayward. You know, LeBron, he came off the bench at one point and went and checked on him in the locker room. I think that says a lot about LeBron and just really tough situation. But moving on from basketball, moving on to basketball, which is extremely hard, like I said, you know, watching the rest of that first half was even tough, even the rest of the game. But, you know, there still was a basketball to be game be played. The Cavaliers did win, but the Celtics showed some punch. Were you surprised the Celtics were able to get back in that game? I I was to, to a degree for sure. Because I, I think, you know, we watched them going to halftime with – uh, you know, they, they looked down. They looked defeated. You know, when Hayward went down, they looked defeated. Um, but we saw a, a common issue that the Cavaliers have had in recent years, and that was a slow third quarter. Um, they came out slow, and the Celtics, you know, for whatever, I, I, I tweeted about this last night. I wish I could have heard what Brad Stevens said. Because even though he said uh, post game that there's nothing he could have said to the team after seeing an injury like that, um, I know he said something. And the guys came out playing with a lot more heart than they did after Hayward went down. They looked more motivated. I mean, Marcus Smart was really aggressive. Um, and, you know, they, they fought and clawed back into that game. And that fourth quarter was the fourth quarter, as you can expect, on the first opening of the opening night between like a guy like Kyrie and LeBron. Yeah. And, I mean, like you said, I think there was either two ways they are going to kind of react at halftime. They're either going to come out and play motivated or they're going to kind of just – you know, throw it away and just go away, in which nobody could even give them a hard time for doing that because of the injury that happened and just so so impactful. But I think the young Celtics really impressed me. You know, you mentioned Marcus Smart. He was definitely super annoying to all the Cavs players. I know he was pissing J.R. Smith off. Um, Jalen Brown, he looked great. A lot more confident on the offensive end. Also on the fast break, he was great. And then Jason Tatum, you know, a little slow start in the first half. Second half, he looked a lot more relaxed and was giving the Celtics that scoring punch they're looking for. Well, and then Kyrie, about- obviously, is Kyrie. How about that, Dick? Jason Tatum, in his first ever NBA game, plays 36 minutes. I, I know Hayward going down with injury, obviously, they need to rely on him more than they probably uh, Stevens would have wanted. But, I mean, 
36 minutes, you're, you have a plus minus of plus six in those 36 minutes. You're playing against arguably the best team in the East. Um, Tatum looked good for a rookie. You know, obviously LeBron baptized with the one block <laughs> early in the game. But it was cool to see Tatum. And, I mean, Jalen Brown, man, he he looks real good. Yeah, he definitely – I mean, in summer league, he looked a little bit rough, but his game looks a lot better. He looks a lot more confident. Obviously, it's only one game. But Tatum, like you said, I think a lot of people going to the season didn't think about him as a rookie of the year because the minutes might not be there. Might have to reconsider that, especially after last night's performance and the team he's playing on. Expecting big things. One more thing about the Celtics. So I, I was impressed Kyrie had 10 assists. That kind of flew under the radar. That's kind of what they're really looking for is him to become that true point guard and the scoring point guard at the same time. Actually, until you mentioned that, and I'm, I'm looking at it now, I didn't realize he had 10 assists either. That was a, uh, a low-key 10 assists. And it almost, and even though he had 22 points, you know, Jalen Brown had 25. I, I didn't realize Kyrie wasn't the top scorer last night. It felt like he was uh, pushing the offense, but I was clearly wrong. Yeah, I mean, and now, obviously, with the Hayward injury, Kyrie's going to have a bigger load. So it's going to be really fun to watch him all season long. What do you think about the Celtics now? Do you think that they're going to be able to still stay in the top of the East, or how far are they going to fall? Uh, this is a topic that uh, that I, I'm really interested to talk about, because um, I think two through six now in the East is wide open. This... I think Boston will remain competitive, but I, I'm not sure they're a lock now to be a, a two seed. Um, and I don't know if they're a lock to be a three seed. Uh, losing Hayward in the games is a big loss. I I wouldn't be surprised if you know if the Bucks get off to a hot start or Washington. You know the the East right now from six to two is wide open. Yeah, I mean, other than the Cavs in the East, nobody's really locked into their position. We don't really know what to expect from some of these top teams. You know, is Washington going to take another step? Is Toronto going to be better? Is Milwaukee going to take that big jump? Are any of these players going to get hurt or anybody going to fall and kind of take a step back in their career? You know, the Eastern Conference is really fun. It's funny because the East is kind of full of unknowns and, like, you don't know who's going to be what. And the West on the other side is super exciting, but it's because there's so much great talent and you already know what you're kind of getting. So it's like the different conferences is always fun to watch. No, for sure. The it's there's a clear difference between the East and the West, just like any other year. The East is going to be the kind of conference that has to grind out games for wins, and the West will be like the Rockets Warriors game where they score 120 and there's you know little defense. Yeah, it should be a really fun season. I'm I'm super excited to see what happens in the East and in the West. But enough about the Celtics. Let's talk about the Cavalier side. Obviously, you know what did you think about the Cavs' new pieces? You know the Derrick Rose, Dwayne Wade. Jeff Green, you know, who really impressed you last night? Uh, I mean, LeBron impressed me. <laughs> <laughs> he always does. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, see, okay, well, Jeff Green had a couple nice moments. Wade looked rather old, but, again, he had a couple nice moments. I mean, there was one moment where him and LeBron had blocks um, in the second half, which was really cool to see, like, back-to-back blocks. Yep. Um, Derrick Rose looked good early. Uh, defensively, he looked bad all night. He still doesn't know what he's doing, it looks like, which I didn't expect to change. Um, I thought Jay Crowder played very well, though. Yeah. I, even though he shot three for ten, I really liked Jay Crowder because, I mean, he got a lot of wide open looks. They just didn't go down. But, yeah, I uh, mentioned this on the – oh, He was good. Yep. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, and I mentioned this last night, I think, on the OTG Twitter. Is you said Jay Crowder, and I think that probably was the biggest addition out of all the guys that played last night. Not, you know, he didn't hit his shots, which, which whatsoever, it's whatever. But defensively, he gives him that versatility. He gives Ty Lue that lineup versatility. He's somebody they can play at the three, the four, and then if they want to go super small, play him at even the five a little bit. I think it's definitely going to be a nice piece for them to have, and it's going to allow them to play a different way, especially when they match up with a team like Golden State. But like you said about D. Rose and Dwayne Wade, they had their moments and they also had those sour moments when you're like, you know, this is what really can hurt them when they go against the, a Western Conference team. You know, there yeah. was some flashes there and there was some flaws. And uh, I know that, like you, if anyone watches this, you know that Nick's a big spacing guy. And, I, and, and the Rose were on the floor at the same time. I constantly could hear you, Nick, talking about the spacing. Because, yeah. I mean, that's, the starting five last night had four threes total. That's Good, rough. The new age of basketball. And then I think uh, somebody pointed out on Twitter, this wasn't me, but mentioning the spacing, like you said, 
they had a point where they had Dwayne Wade, Derrick Rose, and Tristan Thompson on the floor. Oof. So, I mean, that is just 0% spacing. Obviously, you expect Dwayne Wade and Derrick Rose to probably pick up their three-point percentage a little bit, knowing that they're going to have to shoot threes, but it's still not at the rate at, you know, somebody like the Warriors who's bringing off Swaggy P dropping threes on everybody. So I, I just think that the shooting could definitely be an issue for the Cavs. We didn't really see a lot of Kyle Korver. He played last night, but it, he didn't really have much of an impact. So the shooting could be something that needs to step up for the Cavaliers, especially when they play some of these high-scoring teams. Yeah, they, they went with Shumpert and Green over Kyle Korver last night. Um, you know, because of all these players, the rotations are going to be strange. Uh, and, you know, Korver's a little bit older. I'm not sure we're going to see a ton of Kyle Korver. Yeah. Has been playing. Because Jeff Green, you know, for what it's worth, uh, he had a good and bad sighting last night. But um, he ha- he's just more athletic. And, and I think that matters to what LeBron wants this cap team to be. Because at the end of the day, this is, you know, Coach LeBron, right? Yeah, and I mean, when you play a team like Boston, like we said, played a lot of young guys, you're going to need that uh, that athleticism out there. I think Jeff Green, like Jay Crowder, is another piece. If he can kind of steady his game and not make the mistakes and have the highlight plays, you know, kind of find somewhere in the balance, he offers him another versatile piece. You know, he can shoot the three a little bit. He can play a little three. He can play a little four, and he can play some small ball five. So that's another guy that, you know, I think LeBron wants to see have a big season. Him and Jay Crowder, I think, are two of the most important pieces for the, the Cavs moving forward. I would agree with that. And then you mentioned it, King James, LeBron. <laughs> I mean, this dude is amazing. You know, I just enjoy watching him play. It's just hard to not like him, especially the stuff he does off the court. But then when he's on the court, just watching him smile and just make the plays, and sometimes he makes it look so damn easy. Um, when he hit the the one, was it a three? And he was doing the, like, you know, like come up on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was pacing backwards down the court. Um, that was prime. He was laughing, just having a good time. But like you mentioned, yeah. 29 points, 16 rebounds, 9 assists, 2 blocks. Uh, I picked him for MVP, and he, he made me look good the first night at least. For sure. And I think the fact that uh, he grabbed 16 boards is big because he, he knows the Cavs are going to play smaller this year. So the fact that he's already in there, you know, messing around. Also, shout out to Kevin Love. Had a, you know, one of the guys shouted this out on Twitter. He had a sneaky double-double. So K-Love had a solid and, game too. And the, the game-winning three, I believe. Oh, true. The three that yeah, yeah, put them ahead yeah. was in the yeah, it was in the corners. Yeah, that was the clutch one. And it's only like, three of the game. Yeah. We'll touch on that last play too. Obviously, Kyrie had the chance to to rip the hearts out of Cavalier fans and hit that game winner over LeBron, but it didn't happen. Well it would no, it would have tied the game. It would, oh, tied the scored, game. Yeah, but, he would have just forced overtime. But man, wasn't it uh, I I put a live reaction to it up on um Twitter because we were watching it obviously and uh when he when they first miss the three and they get the rebound, and Kyrie gets it, you hear everyone in the room go, "Oh my god!" Because then you know you see LeBron closing out on Kyrie, and you think, "Is Kyrie about to drain this over LeBron?" And <laughs> upon first look, it looks like he drains it, but he airballs it. Yeah, you can. It looks good coming out because you see it like straight up with a hoop, and like, all right, maybe he's gonna hit this. Do you think he should have shot over Le- LeBron the first time and not like step to the side, or it was fine with what he did? I mean. The I think the high percentage look would be the first when he first caught the ball, right? Yeah. But, you know, he he obviously – I mean, I'm not going to question Kyrie when it comes to taking, you know, big-time threes. Uh, but I I think the first the first look he had was probably the higher percentage chance, but he wanted to live. Do you think space. LeBron flustered him? Do you think LeBron flustered him a little bit? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you're – what's Kyrie, 6'2 six, six or whatever? 6'3, I got yeah, a 6'8. Yeah, you got a 6'8 LeBron James running at you. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he, he probably rushed the shot, too, a little bit. And then the fact it was LeBron. I mean, that's a that's like a, a shot full of emotion. It was kind of crazy because at that point, it didn't feel like it was going to, you know, the game was going to be like that. It kind of felt like, you know, the Cavaliers were going to take, take the lead back in the fourth quarter and just win it. But it was a really good game. I was impressed. We saw two great games last night, I think, other than obviously the Gordon Hayward injury, which was terrible. But moving on to the other game, which was a ton of fun. I just I signed me up for this Western Conference Finals already. I don't really care. I want to see Houston Rockets and Golden State seven game series. I think that would be amazing. Ton of scoring, ton of great play, ton of talent on the floor. What were your just initial reactions of watching these two teams play? My initial reaction was pretty much the same sentiment you just made. Um, this is the Western Conference Finals. Um, I, I got a couple arguments with other people who think OKC is better this morning. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I like what Houston has. 
you know, Chris Paul, even on one knee, uh, still looked really good. There's a, excuse me, there's a ton of talent on uh, the Rockets. Like, I mean, their bench unit last night was incredible. Was amazing. Um, yeah, and I mean, they're not good enough to beat the Warriors, especially, you know, if Draymond Green doesn't get hurt late in the game, um, which doesn't look too serious. But Warriors are... It's they lost last year too, if you recall, in the first game of the season by I think like thirty points to the Spurs, and that didn't really mean much in the end game. And uh, this is just a little, a little speed bump, but the Rockets looked real good. Yeah, I mean it's a big win for the Rockets. The fact that they won last night, opening night, spoiled ring night for the Warriors. You know, when they came up clutch, I think obviously Draymond going down was big because, I, like I mentioned to you off pod, he's kind of shines in those big moments. He gets those hustle points. He get, grabs those loose balls. Obviously, though, Chris Paul was banged up. That doesn't look too serious either. So hopefully both guys are, you know, back to normal ASAP. What would you think about the Chris Paul and James Harden combo? Obviously, we didn't get a full take on it because, like we mentioned, Chris Paul was banged up. But what were your initial thoughts of that? Uh, Playmaking-wise, uh, it's exactly what I thought it was going to be. Um, I, I, I figured that, uh, you know, when James Harden was on the floor, he would be the point guard, which is how it was. When Chris Paul was on the floor, he'd be the point guard. And when they were on the floor together, Chris Paul was still like the primary point guard and James Harden kind of went into the more of a scorer mode. Um, but I, I think it's going to be fine. I mean, once Chris Paul gets better, I mean, it was, it was strange, I'll admit, down the fourth quarter stretch to see, uh, James Harden on the floor with no Chris Paul because he wasn't on the floor for uh, crunch time, which um, is the first time I've ever seen Chris Paul not on the floor in crunch time. But as you mentioned, he's a little banged up. But uh, I don't know. I think it can be really good, Nick. Yeah, I- I'm really excited to watch it. I Yeah, and you mentioned it not being there in crunch time. I think that was more of the injury thing. You know, early on, you could tell the chemistry's not 100% there yet. You know, it was like Chris Paul was on the show for a bit, and then James Harden kind of took over more when Paul was banged up. But I mentioned this to you off pod. There was a play in the second half where – James Harden was coming down the floor. Chris Paul came off an off-ball screen, cutting to the hoop. James Harden hits him on the cut. As Chris Paul's cutting, he throws a nice pass to Ryan Anderson for a three, and it just kind of gives you an idea of the playmaking ability when you have somebody like a Chris Paul and a James Harden on the floor at the same time. You have two of the best passers in the NBA, not just you know two of the best passers on this team, two of the best passers in all of the NBA playing on the same team. And I know a lot of people are worried about, you know, oh, there's only one basketball. But this team isn't full of superstars. You know, there's two guys. It's not like a situation where you have three heads to feel like a Russell Westbrook, a Paul George, and a Carmelo Anthony. I think it's a little bit easier when you only have two. And then you surround them with guys that are happy with just shooting the ball. Yeah, um, I still personally would like to see Carmelo instead of Ryan Anderson out there. Yeah, um, Anderson's rough sometimes. You know, he tries, but he yeah, can't do it. He, especially they made him play center at a few times. Because Clint Capella... You know, he's supposed to be a big-time guy for them. And uh, if game one is any indication, he's not there yet. He's uh, He only has four rebounds. I don't know. I just, there's a lot of hope for him, and I just don't see it. I, I've mentioned this a few times in some other podcasts. I just don't see Clint Capella being what the Rockets see him as. But all the other bench guys were huge. Yeah. I mean, Eric Gordon – uh, P- PJ Tucker, uh, Luca Bamute, they all shot a ridiculous percentage off the bench. Obviously, you're not going to be able to keep that up. But just like we mentioned, lineup versatility, I think D'Antoni has some really great options now. They played Tucker anywhere from the two to the five last night, it felt like. He was all over the court defending anybody. And uh, same thing with Abamute. You know, they played him anywhere between the three and the five. And then Eric Gordon, he looked great. I know he looked like he's coming off a great summer working out. He just looked a little bit more explosive. And he had that nice dunk on, I think, Jordan Bell. Yeah, another rookie baptized last night. I, I got a, a staff for you, Nick. Between P.J. Tucker, Eric Gordon, and Abalamute, they scored 58 points on 21 for 34 shooting. Yeah, that's amazing. Obviously, you can't expect that every night, but – that just gives you kind of a glimpse of what you can expect. I know a lot of people were kind of throwing shade at the Rockets bench, and I felt like they have a really deep team, and that's why I like them. And I think, you know, moving forward, just seeing this Chris Paul and James Harden uh, dynamic kind of work together, I think it's going to be really good for this team. They're still, as of right now, they're still my number one threat to the Warriors. I don't think they'd beat them, but like we saw last night, they can give them a challenge. Yeah, We didn't even see a, a Nene sighting last night either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nene didn't play, nor did uh, 
you know, Zik, what, Kizu or whatever the hell his name is. I usually would try to correct you in this situation, but um, if anybody listened to the Houston Rockets preview pod, I have no chance at, at pronouncing that. <laughs> Jay had no chance of pronouncing it. For some reason, Jack, he just nailed it. Like, I don't know, Jack just knew it. When I looked it up to try to learn the pronunciation, three different websites had different ways to pronounce it. I was just like, I'll take the L on this one. Ain't fair. Ain't <laughs> it's right. crazy. Like we need to have like a website dedicated to just learning how to pronounce these international names. We need sound bites. Just someone just to play it for us. We don't have to worry about it. Exactly. But um, mentioning, let's go to the Warrior side a little bit. You mentioned the Draymond thing. You don't think it's that serious? But what type of impact would it have if the Warriors were to lose Draymond for an extended period of time? First, let me just say. The Warriors' new, like, jackets during the ring ceremony are fire. Yeah, they were. They're only wearing them one time in that game, and then never again. That's what they said on the broadcast, so. Well, those are fuego. Everyone I was with last night was trying to buy them. They're they only on auction. They're only on auction. Uh, quick quick, uh, quick note, Steph Curry, I guess, you know, they were working with the wildfire things that happened in California. Terrible for that. Prayers to everybody in California that had to deal with the wildfires. And he wanted to donate extra money. So they already were donating stuff on, I think, Bleacher Report and, like, Turner Sports. But Steph wanted to donate more. So he had everybody who was wearing those jackets last night autograph them. And I think they're going on auction on NBA.com. So really cool. You know, it makes you like Steph a little bit more when you hear things about him like this. Yeah, uh, for sure. And they were nice. I'm not going to auction them because I'm sure they're going to be <laughs> stupid money. But, uh, <laughs> the theory was the good. Um, but back to Draymond Green's injury, yeah. I mean, the guy had nine points, 13 assists, and 11 rebounds when he went down and a block. Um, and you could feel the complexion of the game change when he went out. The, the rhythm of the Warriors kind of seemed to, to tinker off in the fourth quarter. I think they got outscored, what, like 34 to 20 in the fourth quarter? Yeah. yeah I, mean, I don't think he's going to miss an extended period of time. It didn't look that serious. I mean, it was a tweak. There's no doubt that that was a neat tweak. Um, he'll probably miss, I'm guessing, you know, anywhere from two to four weeks. But uh, I don't think it'll be anything that really hurts their title hopes. Yeah, it just kind of just minor bump in the road. What did you think about their defense? You know, the Warriors obviously are known for playing elite defense. You know, they had, I think, what did we say, the number two defensive rating in the league last season. And last night, obviously, letting up a ton of points to Houston. I mean, in the first half, they would look good defensively. Um McCall played some solid defense early. Had, I think, three or four blocks, and only blocked uh, Ryan Anderson um, at least once on the three and then went on the other end and had an and-one play. Um, yeah, I mean, th- uh, these teams do to a degree. You know, when you're, if you're scoring 120 points offensively, you're not playing a lot of defense. Uh, and the second half especially, it just looked like they were – they had 71 points at halftime, and it felt like they kind of in the second half just felt like it was going to be a cakewalk. I don't know. I, I feel like the Warriors, to a degree, kind of took the Rockets for granted in that second half. Yeah, they laid back a little bit because in the first half, like you said, you know, the Warriors, they played better defense. They had a solid lead. The Rockets made their runs, but the Warriors kind of always, you know, smacked them back down. But then when it came later in the game, I think the Rockets kept pushing it on, pushing on the pace, and kept going with those runs. And like you said, the Warriors got a little bit, like, lackadaisical. You know, they did lose a turnover battle. It's crazy to see a team lose a game. The Warriors shot over 50% from three, and they lost, which is one of the rarest things you'll probably see in the NBA. Because the Rockets, only, it's not like the Rockets shot a higher percentage. They only shot 36%. So the fact that the Warriors lost when they shot 52%, that's a big win for Houston. Yeah, they shot, 53, a lot. they shot 53% from the field in general. Yeah. To the, Warriors, the-, to the Rockets, 48%. So, I mean, the turnover battle, I guess, is the real thing you could look at. They did have four more turnovers, and I think Houston did win the battle on the boards. So, oh, no, they didn't even win the battle on the boards. So, it's just turnover battle. So, I mean, Houston, what do you think they can take away with this game and really build upon to kind of hope that they can beat Golden State in the series? For me, it's if, if Chris Paul is healthy and we don't have a slow first half, you know, we don't even because I think last year the mentality was if you're if you're the Rockets, you have to outscore everybody, the Warriors on three pointers. Like you have to shoot more threes. And last night, like we just mentioned, they didn't shoot more threes. They didn't shoot a higher percentage. They but they were able to to gnaw at them. They I mean in that second half they slowed down the tempo too a little bit. They played better they played defense. Warriors speed. Yeah, they were slowing it down a little bit. and They weren't trying to to do like a shootout with the Warriors. And, you know, 
uh, that that's how Cleveland beat the Warriors a couple of years ago is by slowing down the tempo. You don't want the Warriors running up and down the floor because when that happens, you get that uh, in the fourth quarter. Clay Thompson had that three um, in transition. You don't want to give Curry and Clay and Durant and these guys time to have transition threes, which is what they're very good at. Yeah, it's a re- it's extremely important to get back on defense. I thought. You, you were right. In the second half, I think Houston's defense stepped up a little bit. I think the fact they added Chris Paul, P.J. Tucker, Abba Mute, they're better defensive players, and they're just going to change the mentality because I saw you know, even James Harden closing out pretty hard on some threes. So I'm pretty impressed by what I saw with them. We'll definitely keep an eye on them the rest of the season. But moving on, um, I actually forgot to mention you know, we're going to talk about this, but we had a fight in the NBA yesterday, and it was two guys on the same team. Nicole Miritich and Bobby Portis. I guess I wouldn't even call it a fight. I guess they got into altercation at practice, and then Bobby Portis punched him in the face once. Nicole Miritich is now hospitalized, and it just was reported Portis was suspended eight games. What are your thoughts on this? But Well, real um, quick, though, um, prayers with Miritich. I hope everything is okay in the hospital. Nothing's too serious. Yeah, shout out to Miritich. Um, hopefully your face isn't any any worse than it is. He's savage. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was dickhead. I hope he's okay. Um, it was strange. Um, it, it, but it, doesn't it fit the Chicago Bulls? Yes. <laughs> you know, last year they had all the turmoil, and then this year it was just like the Bulls are like, well, we haven't been in the news a lot, guys. Let's, you know, I'm going to punch you in the face. We got to get in the headlines. Um, I was shocked when I got the update. Uh, I was just like, of course, uh, the Bulls have to do something outlandish. Um, it's not good, though. I, I don't like seeing not a good that. luck at all, uh, especially especially team wise. You know, that's especially before you even played one game, you're already beefing with teammates. Uh, that's that's worrisome to me. Uh, I guess there was a report that this this has been building up for almost three years now that the Miritich and Portis relationship was never good, and you know, this is kind of a thing. I guess Miritich kind of like antagonized them a little bit, and. We know Portis is a little bit crazy. You know, his nickname's Crazy Eye Portis. So maybe he was a little bit of Miritich messing with fire. We don't have full details. I don't think we'll ever see a video or anything of it. But just crazy stuff for the Bulls that are already going to have probably one of the worst seasons of the league, most likely. Yeah, they'll be. Uh, I'll make a hot take right now that they're in the bottom three for wins in this this upcoming season. Yeah, I don't even know if that's a hot take. That's more lukewarm in my opinion because I don't yeah. like, <laughs> like their best player is Robin Lopez right now. And. I mean, it's going to be a rough year, but every team needs to rebuild at some point. But what are you most looking forward to tonight? You know, obviously we have a full slate of games recording this on Wednesday, 11 games to watch. Obviously, I know you're pumped to watch Nets and Pacers, but other than that, what are you really excited to watch? Um, As long as Nets Pacers doesn't get blackout restricted, I'm a little worried being up in Albany if I'll be able to get it on League Pass because it's kind of hit or miss. Oh, Um, yeah. Besides them, though, it, it sucked. I was looking forward to Bucks Celtics. Um, not as much now. I think if I had to go with any other game, it's got to be Timberwolves Spurs. Yeah, Team you know, Spurs is a good one. Yeah, I got to see that. You know, Jimmy Butler, Wiggins, Teague, Cat. You know, Jamal Crawford. You know, they made a ton of additions, and I'm interested to see how Rudy Gay looks on the Spurs. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting game for the Spurs with no Kawhi. That's going to be, you know something to see if Aldridge can really step up. For me, I'm kind of interested to see the Nuggets and the Jazz. It's kind of like two polar opposites playing. You know, we know Denver runs up to score a high-paced team, a lot of shooting, a lot of offensive firepower. They added Paul Millsap. Some of the young guns are going to take another step. And then obviously Utah, losing players this offseason, Rudy Gobert's looking to have a big season. They play all defense. So it's like defense, offense colliding. Um, like you said, you know, some of the other matchups are, they have some intriguing storyline to them, but the two games other than the Nets and Pacers, which, you know, I'm a Nets fan, Corey's a Pacers fan, so we probably won't talk after the podcast at least for 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> we also the Hawks get their first loss uh, of the season, which will lead to, you know, another, like, 62 losses. So oh, <laughs> I guess we already know uh, Corey's two worst teams in the league right now, Chicago <laughs> and Atlanta, if you didn't listen to the preview series. If you didn't listen to the preview series, if you listen to the preview series of the Hawks, you know I think they're only going to win 16 games. So, Yeah, quick plug for the preview series. Corey and I you know, went through 1 through 30. Every team previewed over probably 30 hours of content for you to listen to. It's full of hot takes, cold takes, crazy takes, everything you want to kind of hear on an NBA preview podcast. And there is some good information on there too, I promise. Yeah, if you want to get a little bit of your team or a team you're facing these first couple weeks, you know, just head to the preview series and check it out. 
it, it'll give you a nice little backstory before you watch the game. Exactly. It's a good way to prepare for the season, especially if you've kind of missed out on the the number of crazy moves this summer. So, But anything else you're really excited about going to the season that you didn't get a chance to say on the preview series or that you're really looking forward to in the NBA this year? Um, I'll mention – I'll, I'll just mention a game that I'm really looking forward to tomorrow um, since we won't be able to talk about it. I'm looking forward to Knicks Thunder. <laughs> just to see the Knicks I, get I'm re- crushed? I'm ready. Or... Yeah. Well, Przingis said he's going to guard Melo, and I don't know. I'm, interest- I'm, I'm interested. I, I, I want to see Melo drop like 40 on the Knicks just as a nice little sending away party. Just a goodbye. Um, see you later. Thanks for the treatment. Yeah, for for the year, I mean – I don't know. I'm ready to see what the Eastern Conference is going to be now that Hayward's injured. Even though you know it's devastating to see him go down, I think the East now just becomes it's a whole new ball game now. The entire season's changed within six minutes of opening tip, which is you know it's just it's sad, but it's you know at the same time it's just crazy. Yeah, I mean, like really, you know, most of us had the Cavs and Celtics as a lock as one and two, and the rest of the teams are kind of going for that you know going for that third and fourth spot. Now you might see a team make a trade because they think they could maybe pop up a little bit more. Who knows? It could definitely be an interesting season. Um, I'm I'm really excited to just watch the Western Conference. I'm really intrigued to see how some of these new pieces gel and who's going to end up with what, which seeding spots. You know, there's a lot of unknowns. Like we know Golden State's probably going to be number one. We know Houston's probably going to be two, maybe three. I'm, I'm, I'm really high on them. But then you got OKC, San Antonio, Minnesota, Denver, you know, there's just a lot of good teams out west that can really compete and have a lot of talent. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the Western Conference. I think I think the Wolves are a lock at five. But I think like six through like twelve to a degree, you can make an argument that six through twelve is kind of like wide open. Like the, you really can't predict the playoff team. You, you can make a yeah. you can make a case for almost any team in the West to be a playoff team to a degree, besides like the Lakers and the Suns. And the Kings, like those teams, obviously don't have a chance. But for the most part, any other team, you can make a somewhat of an argument. Yeah, there's a couple teams down low that are definitely hard to gauge. So I'm going to be interested to in see how that. I'm, I really want to know because we had so many big superstars and stars move this summer, how they all fit with their new teams. Because we see a lot of times players get traded. It works out amazing. You know, it's just like that boost they need in their career. You know, it's going to happen for D'Angelo Russell, I'm hoping. But uh, then other players, they get traded, and it just doesn't work out at all. And, you know, it, it just looks like they just take a step back, and they have to get moved to another situation. Somebody like, I'll use another Nets example, like a Damari Carroll. I think, you know, moving to Toronto, everybody expected a lot from him. Nothing really happened from that. So it'll be interesting to see which guys really pop up this year and which guys really fall down. Yeah, I think um, it's it sucks because you. I always look at, like, what, what could be. Mm-hmm. But, you know, with all these moves that happen, at least – Two of them, I'll say, will not work in favor of that team. B, but where all these moves happen, at least two of them won't be a good move. Yeah, especially the see, like teams. Dwight Howard, make... that could be a bad move. I could, yeah, so I could we, see that we too. Just won't know. Exactly. So that's something to keep an eye on, and that wraps up for today. Though you can listen to Corey and I on the NBA Outlet all season long. We'll be dropping about two episodes a week. So let us know what you think. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at OTG Basketball. And as always, thank you for listening, and thank you, Corey, for recording. Anytime, Nick. Can't wait to do it next week.